morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. I, I grew up Clay? singing that to my daughter. Clay? Okay. Clay? Come on. You feel led? <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> okay, this morning we're going to stand and sing The Joy of the Lord is My Strength, and we're going to show some joy when we sing it. this week we're lopsided on this side so last week it was that side this week is this side boy if we could just fill them both up at the same time Amen. <laughs> hey i want to welcome you uh, this morning man sc school's out we probably ought to have you know uh what was it is it alice cooper that did the school's out forever uh <laughs> you know the kids probably need to celebrate that some um, but we want to welcome you uh, to our church this morning. Welcome those who are joining us online. And uh, man, just looking forward to a great, busy summer, uh, but a great summer. So uh, let's have a word of prayer. And then when we finish uh, praying, we're going to let everybody uh, greet one another in the Lord. Let us pray. Father, I want to thank you so much for this time that we've been able to have with you. Lord, we've been able to worship you in Bible study, and Lord, we worship you now in praise. I want to thank you for the opportunity to praise your name freely and openly in a nation uh, that protects us uh, in our rights to do that. And Lord, we pray so many uh, thanks for those who are here, and we ask that you be with those who are not here, those who are going to graduations and um you know, being with friends and family uh, during this time. We also pray for those who are sick, who can't be here uh, because they're sick, or who are shut in. Lord, we lift all these up to you, and we ask that you would uh, touch their lives, to, uh, bless their lives, and as well as for those who are here who are worshiping you today and all across this nation during these different times and different time zones, we pray that you bless the lives of everyone as they worship you today. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
together. That'll keep us in rhythm. Here we go. Clap, clap. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, and time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair. When the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll
to sing this one. Draw close to the Lord. Let's stand and get a little closer to Him. Draw me close to you. Never let me go. for you, Lord. We worship you in everything we do. Help us to carry you through the week. Help us to be receptive to your word this morning. Bless the, those with the memorial holiday, those who are going to see family or visit family that they've lost. Lord, help them to get through the weekend and know that our families are with you and we will be together again someday soon. Thank you again for allowing us to worship freely in this country. We ask it in your name. Amen. We are a nation under God, and I believe God intended for us to be free. We must realize that no arsenal or no weapon in the arsenals of the world is so formidable as the will and moral courage of free men and women. The price for this freedom at times has been high, 
but we have never been unwilling to pay that price. Those who say that we're in a time when there are no heroes, they just don't know where to look. The sloping hills of Arlington National Cemetery with its row upon row of simple white markers bearing crosses or stars of David. They add up to only a tiny fraction of the price that has been paid for our freedom. The willingness of some to give their lives so that others might live never fails to evoke in us a sense of wonder and mystery. And if words cannot repay the debt we owe these men, surely with our actions, we must strive to keep faith with them and with a vision that led them to battle and a final sacrifice. Our first obligation to them and ourselves is plain enough. The United States and the freedom for which it stands, the freedom for which they died, must endure and prosper. As we honor their memory today, let us pledge that their lives, their sacrifices, their valor shall be justified and remembered for as long as God gives life to this nation. The sight before us is that of a strong and good nation that stands in silence and remembers those who were loved and who in return loved their countrymen enough to die for them. As we honor their memory today, let us pledge that their lives, their sacrifices, their valor shall be justified and remembered for as long as God gives life to this nation. And let us also pledge to do our utmost to carry out what must have been their wish, that no other generation of young men will ever have to share their experiences and repeat their sacrifice. And so when a serviceman dies, it's a tear in the fabric, a break in the hole, and all we can do is remember. It is, in a way, an odd thing to honor those who died in defense of our country, in defense of us, in wars far away. The imagination plays a trick. We see these soldiers in our mind as old and wise. We see them as something like the founding fathers, grave and gray-haired. But most of them were boys when they died, and they gave up two lives, the one they were living and the one they would have lived. When they died, they gave up their chance to be husbands and fathers and grandfathers. They gave up their chance to be revered old men. They gave up everything for our country us. We owe them a debt we can never repay. All we can do is remember them and what they did and why they had to be brave for us. I can't claim to know the words of all the national anthems in the world, but I don't know of any other that ends with a question and a challenge as ours does. Does that flag still wave? or the land of the free and the home of the brave. Memorial Day, we remember those who have passed on, but just uh, 
How many of you have served in the U.S. military? All right. How many was in the Air Force? How about the Army? Navy? Marines? Coast Guard? What, am I leaving any out? National Guard? This was saying the singers up here were Air Force. I'm just throwing that out there. <laughs> I'll tell you, uh, it is a, it's an honor uh, to have a country where people have, you know, actually fought. And uh, when you think about it, when you sign up for the military, uh, you actually are offering your life uh, for your country. Uh, hopefully you don't have to, you know, fulfill that uh, obligation of surrendering your life. Um, but, you know, those are the things that you have to realize when, when you get in that situation. And part of that ties into, or that ties into what, what we would call uh, or talk about with grace. Grace is a word that is, refers to God's unmerited favor. That means we don't earn it. God gives it to us because He loves us. It's, it's like, um, you know, the, the benefit that, that we get because God exists. And, and there are things that God gives us that fall into what is, is known as common grace. Um, and those are the things that are common to everybody, everywhere, you know, all the time. So he gives us uh, farmlands, he gives us farmers, he gives us uh, lives, you know, areas where we grow pastures, where we grow livestock and cattlemen or uh, different livestock, you know, kinds of people, uh, plumbers, uh, you know, electricians, carpenters, bricklayers, nurses, teachers, uh, all these things are things that God gives us as common grace. And, and those are the types of things that we get to experience a good life. He also gives us a conscience, right? So that we, we have a knowledge of what's right and wrong. And we want to live in a peaceful society. We, you know, so we have laws. He gives us governments to administer justice and peace. And those are all things that are blessings from God that are common to everybody. And then there's a, uh, a special application of grace that is in reference to those who believe on the name of Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus came. He's the Son of God. He took on human flesh. And he came and walked upon this earth, lived a righteous life, and then in God's timing, he went to the cross, and in his death on the cross, his suffering leading up to, and his death on the cross, he took all of our sin and guilt on himself. So that for those who believe, you know, the price would have been paid for our sin. We had no way of meeting the requirement for sin. So Jesus did that on our behalf. And his resurrection was his demonstrated his ability uh, to give us life. And so that he had authority over life. So, so we look in this special grace and we see God working in the lives of people who respond in faith, right? So, so God gives us special grace, and hopefully the only response that people take is the response of faith. That's what we hope for. That's what we aspire to as we talk to others and as we live in front of others is that we would lead them to that point and to that decision and that their response would be in the affirmative that they would say, yes, I want to grasp that grace. You know, when he was working with the nation of Israel, he was giving them special grace that was unique to a nation. 
It was unique to a nation. He was giving them a promised land and he was working with them and, and talking to them about their grace. And, and Moses had a generation of Israelites that was about to enter the promised land. We had read now about the ones and, and all the events that happened with those who failed to capitalize on that grace. But this group, this generation, Moses is speaking to, and he is talking to them about God's grace and how it applies for them in their lives. And we are going to see that in the reading. So I'm going to ask you to stand with me, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter 11. And we're going to read. It says, Therefore... You shall love the Lord your God and keep his charge, his statutes, his judgments, and his commandments always. Know today that I do not speak with your children who have not known and who have not seen the chastening of the Lord your God, his greatness and his mighty hand and his outstretched arm his signs and his acts, which he did in the midst of Egypt to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and to all his land, what he did to the army of Egypt, to their horses, and to their chariots, how he made the waters of the Red Sea overflow them as they pursued you, and how the Lord has destroyed them to this day. What he did for you in the wilderness until you came to this place and what he did to Dathan and and Abraham, the sons of Eliab, the son of Reuben, how the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up, their households, their tents, and all their... and all the substance that was in their possessions in the midst of all Israel. But your eyes have seen and... seeing every great act of the Lord, which I did. Let us pray. Father, I want to thank you for your grace, your special grace. The fact that your son died on the cross and nailed all the handwriting of the ordinances that are written against us to that cross so that when they pulled him off that cross, all of our sin remained nailed to that cross. Lord, I pray that if there are any here today who are lost and without you, Lord, that, that, that they might give their lives to you through repentance and faith in you. I pray that as we continue to go as, as believers, that we would see your grace working in our lives or the opportunity for grace to work in our lives and our response to that grace. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. You know, when, when the Israelites were in Egypt, right? They were in the territorial bounds of the Egyptians, and Pharaoh was their taskmaster, and, and they had enslaved the Jews during that time. And, and what had to happen was God came in, and he had to show his power and his might to the Israel or to both the the Egyptians and to the Israelites he had to demonstrate to the to the Egyptians they were not who they thought they were and he had to demonstrate to the Israelites what they needed to believe about him that he was the powerful and the almighty god And that when he freed them, they needed to get up and move, right? It it would have been one thing for him to defeat the Egyptians and them going, you know, wow, that's awesome. God, God killed all them Egyptians and just stayed there, right? But for them to experience grace, they needed to move. They needed to pack up and get out of Dodge. And so they did. And they left and they went through and and God opened the Red Sea. They went through on dry ground. And as the Egyptians regathered and, you know, kind of got their senses back about them again, 
you know, they thought, man, we're going to go after those Israelites. They followed them into the Red Sea. As soon as the Israelites got through, God let the Red Sea come crashing down on the Egyptians. He demonstrated to them his power and his might in the deliverance of, of them from the territorial bounds of Egypt and the bondage of Pharaoh. And they were no longer slaves to Pharaoh. They were now delivered into God's hand. And that's what the New Testament tells us, right? Is that Paul says he's not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God to the salvation first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. God demonstrates his power in our lives in that he delivers us from the territorial bounds of death and the taskmasters of sin. We live outside of Christ. We live within the territorial bounds of death and our slave masters is sin. We are in bondage to sin. So that's where we live. And God through Christ has delivered us from the kingdom of darkness and del delivered us into the kingdom of the son of his love. That's an experience of grace. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, your response to that should be the only sensible response there is, and that is a response of faith. When grace is presented, we believe. And that belief has action. That faith is actionable. It's not that we are saved by works. It's that we are now different than what we were before. And that's what God was teaching them as they got into the wilderness and he would demonstrate to them who he was. They had manna on the ground. When they needed food, hey, he just said, oh, okay, every day you're going to get manna. You know, they, didn't, they had livestock and all that other stuff. They didn't have to kill any of that. They were able to go out and collect manna every day. When they needed water, he provided water. Everywhere they went, and if we go back and read, their feet never swelled, their clothes never wore out, and they ended up, because of some bad decisions they had, they made, they ended up wandering in the wilderness until they naturally died, and God protected them. He had a cloud over them by day, so they weren't their skin wasn't burnt, they weren't susceptible to that. He had a pillar of fire. Uh, to guide them at night so they could see where they were going. He took care of them. That was God's grace. And when they made mistakes, he disciplined them. But there's also those who rejected God's grace. And that's where we see the judgment of God coming in. You see, there's two families that led a rebellion against Moses. And in that time, what they did is they came in and they rejected Moses, which in turn was rejecting God. And what God did is he punished them and judged them and punished them quickly and deliberately and, and very thoroughly. He, not only did the leaders of the rebellion die, but their entire families died. So the, the punishment was swift. It was harsh. But it spoke to the Israelites that you don't reject God. But his grace is offered and it is to be received. And if you don't receive it, then, right, you suffer the consequences of that decision. And that's like salvation. That's like God working in us. You know, we have... As Christians, we have things that God provides for us. And, and, and you know, he, he gives us purpose. He gives us security. He gives us things that, you know, normally uh, people around uh, don't have. And he pours his grace out on us. There is a, uh, there is a study that was done by a group called the Center for Bible Engagement. And they worked with Gallup and Barna and some of these other pollsters, and they went and did a study on people. And what they were uh, asking was what specific discipline 
impacted the person's life the most. And they asked them about going to church. They asked them about prayer life, their prayer lives. They asked them about their Bible reading time. And they asked them about, you know, just identifying as a Christian. Uh, those types of things were the questions they asked. What they found out was that the fact that a person just went to church, you know, just had a prayer life didn't really impact their lives very, very much at all. Well, then they asked about a person who went to church. Now, you got to assume if someone's going to church, there's probably some form of prayer life. May not be every day, maybe once in a blue moon, but there's probably, you know, at least when they're standing there in the congregation, you know, during the songs, you know, during the worship, you know, during the message, all that other stuff, there's prayer going on. So there's some kind of prayer at least once a week that they're happening. So the church, again, just prayer in church had a little impact on their lives. And then they talked about, okay, now what about if you read the Bible one to three days a week? So you assume, well, the person's probably got a prayer life. They'll probably go to church if they're reading the Bible one to three days a week. That may not be true, but, but it's, you know, it's probably a fair assumption. So they, they asked them that, and there was minimal impact. Then they say, well, what about if you read the Bible four to seven times a week? And that's where the switch flipped. And it went exponentially in, in a way that God's grace was evident in their lives. So those people who studied the Bible four to seven times a week were 57%. The probability of them going out and get, uh, getting drunk was reduced by 57%. The probability of them having sex outside of marriage was reduced by 68%. The probability of them viewing pornography was reduced by 61%. The probability of them gambling was reduced by 74%. And for them to not do any of those things, the probability was reduced by 57%. Percent. What is it? He says, you shall know my commandments. And folks, there must be something that is tied to reading and studying the Bible four to seven times a week that influences our lives so that we begin to behave in accordance to what the Bible lays out for us to do. And God's grace is poured out. You see that? That's, that's God's grace. That's poured out. And you say, man, well, I don't, you know, I don't read the Bible that much. Well, guess what? If you do, then we have the anticipation of grace. And that's where we pick up and we read what he's promising them that is going to happen in their lives. He says, therefore, you shall keep my commandment, which I command you today that you may be strong and go in and possess the land which you cross over to possess, and that you may prolong your days in the land which the Lord swore to give your fathers to them and their descendants, <clears throat> a land flowing with milk and honey. For the land which you go to possess is not like the land of Egypt from which you have come, where you sowed your seed and watered it by foot as a vegetable garden. But the land which you cross over to possess is a land of hills and valleys which drinks water from the rain of heaven, a land for which the Lord your God cares. The eyes of the Lord your God are always on it from the beginning of the year to the very end of the year. And, and we see here that when they, if they would follow God's grace, they could, they could anticipate even more grace as they go in and inhabit the land. Now, I want us to, to understand 
For the Christian, right, we're not talking about going in and possessing land. We're talking about a life that's impacted by God's grace. And, and we see what they, when they were in, G, in Egypt, the Jews had to do things the man-made way, right? They, they had to literally go and get buckets of water out of the Nile, and that's how they irrigated the crops in, uh, in around the Egypt. There, the, the Egyptian area would have been mainly desert, except for that area immediately around the Nile. And for them to have any of that other land to be productive, they, it was manually powered for them to get water irrigated into those areas. But God is saying, hey, when you go to that land that I'm promising you, I'm taking care of all of that. You see, when I live over here in, in man's ways, and I encounter sin, sin may have a temporary joy and happiness to it. The adulterer may say, as soon as he gets done with the act, he may say, man, I feel good, but later on it's going to lose its luster when he has to go back and lie and be deceptive to his wife and family. The drug addict may say, man, I love my high. But then when they come down, they have to face the reality that they're trying to escape. And the whole time, they're destroying themselves. They're destroying themselves when we follow man's way. We destroy ourselves when we follow man's way. But when we follow God's way, God takes care of it. God fulfills the requirement. I mean, let's just think about this. <clears throat> The, the idea of someone not getting drunk is reduced by 57%. Or not committing adultery or, or having sex outside of marriage is reduced by 68%. Just think of everything else that they didn't ask that's going on. This is how God's grace works. That we have to embrace it. He's willing to pour it out onto us. We just have to receive it. Even if it means taking a little bit of time every day to read and study His Word. In this study, they were polling 40,000 people. All of them were, they, they, it was just Americans, right? And then out of that, they found that about 36% of those people read the Bible one day a year or less. About 33% read the Bible maybe once a week. And then when we calculate into that, that about a third of the population is evangelical, then we began to look and say, okay, out of the evangelicals, how many were reading the Bible four to seven times a week? And that came out to about 25%. So about out of about 90 to 100 million people, about 25 million are reading the Bible four to seven times a week, which means 7% of the population in the United States is reading the Bible four to seven times a week. wonder if that's why our nation is in such distress. I wonder if because the church is shutting the door to God's grace, if that's a problem. And, and when I... When I say that, understand that that only means, you know, let's say we were to take this group here and however many there are, let's say there's 50, that means that only 25%, that means 10 out of 50, you know, maybe, or, or 12, whatever the number is. Clay could probably give me the exact number, the 16, 17. Uh, out of the group, 
only 16 to 17 people out of the group actually read the Bible four to seven times a week. And we wonder why we have problems in our lives. We wonder why we struggle. We wonder why our nation is going absolutely insane. Could it be that the church is turning off the spigot of grace and not allowing it to pour out into the nation? Simply by not taking about 20 to 30 minutes a day and reading God's Word. I've told you before, four chapters a day will get you through the Bible in a year. Four chapters a day. And you don't have to become biblical scholars. You just need to develop a working knowledge. But a lot of it, you know what this is? This is reading the Bible and then allowing the Bible and then allowing that to take its natural course. What does that mean? That means I'm going to start doing, it's going to become an influence in my life. And I'm going to start doing what the Bible says. And then as we look for that, we, we begin to see uh, the service of grace. And, and we come into this next section, and we see, sorry about that, we see, he says in verse 13, And it shall be that if you earnestly obey my commandments, which I command you today to love the Lord your God and serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, then I will give you rain for your lands in the season, the early rain in the la and the latter rain, that you may gather in your grain, your new, your new wine and your soil. And I will send grass in your fields for your livestock that you may eat and be filled. Take heed to yourselves, lest your heart be deceived and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. Lest the Lord's anger be aroused against you, and he shut up the heavens so that there be no rain, and the land yield no produce, and you perish quickly from the good land which the Lord has given you. We, you know, the first thing that stands out is the provision of God, right? He is providing for the land. And God provides for us. He will, he will, if, if we will, Embrace his grace. Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Our focus, our priority should be on the kingdom of God. Now, that doesn't mean I can't take vacation. It doesn't mean that I can't go to work. It doesn't mean my kids can't be involved in extracurricular activities. What it means is when I'm involved in those things, when I'm doing those things, what is my priority? Who am I there to glorify? Who am I there to honor? When I'm on vacation, am I glorifying God? You know, if someone's in need, if I'm on vacation and someone's in need, do I reach out a helping hand? If I'm, if I'm at work and someone's struggling to get work done, do I help them? When we, and, and extracurricular activities, I'll tell you what, can be a whole field of, just like these other things, they can be a, a, an opportunity to disciple and lead others to Christ. And so when I'm involved in extracurricular activities, either with my kids or, or whatever the case may be, what am, who am I representing? The provision is that God gives us grace to behave correctly in those environments. Our problem is, is we confuse the priorities and we put those things as a higher priority than God. So that he then doesn't even rank as high as an extracurricular activity. And we see also here that we must be diligent to maintain that. We have to work at it. We have to 
have ourselves accountable and, and we have to make sure that we don't get tired and give up on doing it. In this survey that they did, the questions were asked, why don't you read the Bible four to seven times a week? And I had a, a variety of responses, but they all basically came down to a couple of things. They said, I read the Bible and I don't understand it. But if I had a group that I could go to to help me understand the Bible and would hold me accountable to the lessons and, and, and that I could interact with that group, then I would probably be more faithful to reading the Bible. Hmm. I wonder what Sunday school does. I wonder what Sunday school does. Or as some churches call it, life groups. I wonder what life groups do. You see, here we... We have Sunday school. We have the tools. The, the church can be doing the things the church is supposed to be doing, and people have to take advantage of those opportunities. If you're struggling with your walk, then join a Sunday school class. Get involved. Because I want to tell you, you're not going to walk in there and find a bunch of self-righteous people. You're going to find in there, you're going to walk in there and find out, boy, there's a whole lot of people messed up. <clears throat> but they're talking about it. They're talking about how God's word applies to their lives. And that was the, the other part is they didn't understand how God's word applied to their lives. And that's what we have to come to is, is we have to say, man, when I'm reading it, you know, what are the opportunities? It's, it's 30 minutes, four to seven times a week. It's one hour earlier. And, and what's God's grace to? Reduces the probability of drunkenness by 57%. Reduces the probability of sex outside of marriage by 68%. Reduces the, the access to pornography by 61%. Reduces the, uh, the likelihood of gambling by 74% reduces the overall temptation to do all of those things by 57%. It's greater than a 50%. Now, if I was to come to you and say, hey, you know what? I have a 60, you know, if, if we go invest our money in something, we have a 60% guarantee that we're going to get a huge return on that investment. Most of us would really consider that. If a doctor came up and said, hey, if I remove this cancer from you, if you'll let me do the surgery to remove this cancer for you, from you, you'll have a 60% chance of surviving and living for 20 more years. What would you do? Well, those are no duh, you know. Those are no-brainer types of questions. And all it is, maybe 30 minutes a day, one hour on Sunday, one extra hour on Sunday. I mean, is it that hard? Is it that hard? The study goes on to say that it asks the question, how many people have read the Bible all the way through? For people that are ages 18 to 24 years old, only 25% had read the Bible all the way through. And these are Christians. For people 25 years and older, only 50% had read the Bible all the way through. Man, we're not accessing grace. It's like there's this truckload of blessing, volumes of blessing, waiting for us to open the doors to let God pour out. And we won't access it. 
We won't access it. Where do you fall in in those stats? Where do you fall in? And I'm not, listen, I'm not, I'm not saying you're a terrible person if you haven't done it. What I'm saying is this is how we access God's grace. This is how we access God's grace. These are his promises to us. And why don't we access those promises? What is it that keeps us from doing that? And we have to lies in our willingness to get closer to God. Because when I know who God is, I'm more likely to live according to how God wants me to live. Now you want to hear the upside to this? For those who read the Bible four to seven times a week, the likelihood of them sharing their faith is increased by 228%. The likelihood of them discipling someone is increased by 231%. The likelihood of them memorizing scripture is increased by 407%. And what's the Bible said? I have hidden your word in my heart. Why? That I might not sin against you. Isn't it funny how that works? Isn't it funny? When we really get to know God's Word, when we're really interested, we're really getting to know God, and we become more like Christ. Christ didn't walk around going, uh, what did I say? Was it Isaiah, Jeremiah? Uh, uh. He didn't walk around doing that. He knew. The people that challenged Him knew. And he was able to rebut their challenges because he knew the truth. He knew they had perverted the truth. And so he spoke to them in ways that revealed God's truth. And God's truth is, you can struggle in life because of you're not willing to open the Word of God or you can open the Word of God 30 minutes a day, an hour extra on Sunday, and not struggle as much. It's your choice. It's your choice. What do you want to do with that? What would you tell your kid if you were explaining to your kids, hey, if you obey, these good things will happen. If you disobey, these bad things will happen. What do you tell your kid when they choose the bad every time? You look at them and you think, are you my kid? You thick-headed little turkey, you know? <clears throat> and and that's, why, that's how we approach it. Well, what about us? Maybe they're doing that because that's exactly how we are. And in this situation, we see that God's grace is initiated when He first offers you to come to a saving knowledge of Him. The Bible says, It is by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. When I am running away from God, I need to stop and turn to God, and by grace, or by faith, receive God's grace in the person of Jesus Christ. That's what I have to do. I have to believe that Jesus died on the cross for me, and He took all my sin and guilt, and that by receiving that, right, by receiving that, I will be saved. That's what God says, that's what He promises, so that's what I'm going to believe. And if I do that, then I will have an eternal loving relationship with my Heavenly Father in Heaven and with the Lord Jesus Christ and with the Holy Spirit. God, The Father loved me in that He gave His Son. His Son loved me in that He sacrificed His life for me. The Holy Spirit loves me in His regenerative work in my life. All three love me. And what makes sense? 
What makes sense is to choose them back. It's to choose God back. And if we choose Him to save us, then it makes sense to choose Him to live our lives every day. It just makes sense. So we have a prayer that we put up. And that prayer is for those who do not know Christ, have not had a sincere relationship with Christ, have not made that decision yet. And this prayer is to help you put into words maybe the things that you might want to say to God in order to have and establish a sincere relationship with Him. This is what we offer. This prayer to get saved. And that's for those who are non-Christians. For the Christians... Every American family that they surveyed, Christian and non-Christian, on average had four Bibles in their home. Now I can hold on to it like this, or I can do that. That is not going to get me blessing. It's not going to let me experience God's grace. This is going to let me experience God's grace. Whether you need Sunday school or not, someone may need you. It's not just about what you get out of it. It's what you can pour into it. I'm going to tell you, 85% of the families who go to Sunday school and church will end up, Every 85% of the kids that go to Sunday school and church will end up going to church as adults. That's the power of God's grace. It's not like he's asking a whole lot. And the things that we give up, man, someone in Sunday school class said today, they were totally meaningless. Totally meaningless compared to what they have now. This is a decision time. I'm going to ask you to stand. I don't know what the Holy Spirit is leading you to do. If you are a non-believer and you've prayed uh, sincerely to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'm going to invite you to come forward to make that public knowledge. Why? Because Jesus didn't die in a closet. He died right out in the open where everybody could see Him. And He says, if you will not profess Me before men, then I will not profess you before my Father in heaven. There are no closet Christians. Maybe you're looking for a church home. Whatever it is that you're looking for, what God, whatever the Holy Spirit is leading you to do, it's time to obey. It's time to stop shutting off the grace tap. And it's time to start turning it on and receiving that grace in your life. Let us pray.